Welcome to the Church of God of Chesapeake, Virginia. We invite you into our service. We have a service in our home. The Bible said it was two or three are gathered together in his name. He is in the midst. Amen. So we thank God for that. We ask that you would pray for us here in Chesapeake, and we hope you enjoy the teaching lesson this day. We're going to open up our service with prayer, and then we're going to sing Church Jubilee. Let us bow our heads. Lord, we thank you this day for your goodness, for your mercy. We thank you, Father, for how great you are, Father, in our lives. We thank you for what you do for us each you, and Lord. every day, Lord God. We appreciate it. We realize we're so insufficient of ourselves oh, to Lord. do or to think anything of ourselves, Lord. Truly, it's in thee that we live, we move, we have our being. So now we call upon thee that you will bless, you would have your way, O oh yes, God, Lord. Lord, that even as this uh, video goes out into cyberspace, O oh God, that yes, it will be an encouragement. And even those that are at home and sick and afflicted, O oh God, they can enjoy this, O oh God. O oh God, we ask that you just have your way. Bless, dear God, we truly commit ourselves into your hand and say keep it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Page six in the Evening Light Songbook, the Church Jubilee. The light of evening time that shine the darkness to dispel. The glory of the Zion's face and thousand voices tell. For out of Babel, God does call and scatter saints in one. To gather all the church, compose the body of his son, oh, church of God, the day of Jubilee has died so bright and glorious for thee. Rejoice, be glad, thy shepherd has become his long divided flock again to gather into one. The Bible is our rule of faith, and Christ alone is Lord. Are we our equal in His sight when we obey His word? No earthly master do we know, to man who will not bow, but to each other and to God eternal truth. Oh, Church of God, the day of Jubilee has gone so bright. And glorious for thee, rejoice, be glad, thy shepherd has become his own divided flock again to gather into one. The day of sex increase for us forevermore is past. Our brotherhood are all the saints upon the world so bad. We reach our hands in fellowship to every blood once one. While love entwines about each heart in which God will the old church of God, the day of Jubilee, has died so bright and glorious for me. Rejoice, be glad, that shepherd and be God, his long divided flock again to gather into one. Oh, blessed truth that broke our bands, in it now rejoice. While in the holy church of God we hear our Savior word, And gladly to his blessed will submissive we shall be. And from the yokes of Abel war, from his fault we are free. Oh, church of God, the day of Jubilee has died so bright. And glorious for thee, rejoice, be glad, thy shepherd has begun. His own divided is locked again to gather into one. Amen. The church you believe. How many are happy this morning about the church of God? Amen. Amen. How many are happy this morning about what God is doing in Chesapeake? Thank you, Lord. We Amen. thank God for that. We should listen to the prayers of the saints everywhere in regards to, amen, the renovation, amen, of our new location. It's actually around the corner from the house here on Providence Road. We thank God that it has started. Amen. Amen. We thank God for that, and we're just looking for God to do great things and 
that God will give us the best choice contractors. I think about the tabernacle when the tabernacle was built. The Bible said that God chose skilled workers. And so that's what we're looking for too. We thank God. We also pray for every church of God congregation. Even our brothers in Africa. We thank God for that. In Nigeria. Oh yes. God, we ask that thou will bless them likewise. There's truly many camp fires lit this morning. The yeah. glory of God, hallelujah, is on many camps this morning. And above all, we pray that God will get the glory as well as on us this morning. We're going to ask you to turn your Bibles to Proverbs, the 29th chapter. I want to say this by way of introduction this morning, that we're starting a class online called the Revelation Study Group. You can access it through uh, my webpage, not webpage, but Facebook page. Everything is Facebook nowadays, you know, I thank God for it. And really, the social networking can be a blessing and it can be a curse. But we see fit to use it, amen, to the glory of God as a vehicle to get the gospel out. So. Uh, we're not using it to throw stones, amen. We don't use it to cause division, amen. amen. Now, if truth separates you, amen, that's a different thing. Because we are here to, amen, make known the difference between that which is right and that which is wrong, amen. So we thank God for that this morning. So in Proverbs, the 29th chapter, we kind of got a twofold scripture. 2918 Proverbs, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I like the first part. Where there is no vision, the people perish. All right? Now, this isn't talking about a vision statement. For your particular faith. But the vision here is talking about a divine revelation and inspiration from God for the people of God. And if you turn with me to the book of Revelation, the first chapter, we're going to get into it a little bit about this vision. As I said, we started an online class. And in this online class, it is my desire, amen to open up the book of this prophecy, which is the last book of the Bible. If, if there's anything in time that we need more, it is a vision whereby we may see our way through this chaos, amen, through the different circumstances that the church faced in the world today. Amen. I want you to know that the book of Revelation, this symbolic book, is a book like a helm on a ship to guide us to. Amen. The other side. So I ask you to uh, uh, lower your ankles. Cast them right here. Amen. I desire that you open and help us break the ice on this book because as of now, in 2014, many are no longer preaching this message. Amen. This message is a byword and a hiss to some. They don't see a need for it. But we want to talk about vision today. Amen. And why God sends his people vision. And why the yes. church has to have a vision to see her way through. All right. So in Revelation... The first chapter, it says, the rev uh, one and one, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time 
is at hand. So here, this is a book that has symbols, many different symbols in it. And these symbols are put here for a purpose. And I want you to know, everybody will not understand and do not know what these symbols mean. But God has given the interpretation of this book only to a certain group of people. First of all, one of the requirements to understand the things of God, you must be born again. You must be saved. You must be washed yes. in the blood of Jesus Christ. All right? Now, I said earlier, where there's no vision, the people perish. Why do God use visions to speak to his people? One of the reasons is to help his people maneuver through storms. And the church is in a storm today. One thing about this prophetic message in reference to the church of God, it helps the church of God, the true church of God. I ain't talking about church of God sex. Amen. I'm not talking about church of God denomination. But what this book does, the right understanding of this book, it separates her. Amen and make her distinct from every other earthly organization out here. And that's what we're going to show you what the vision does. Now, anytime God's people has always faced a situation, God has sent vision, amen, to encourage them. There was a time, uh, starting back from the book of Genesis, we know there was the age of the patriarch. Well, I'll back up. There was the antediluvian, uh, antediluvian age, the age of Noah. After that age, the come, came along the age of the patriarchs, which were Abraham. Then after that came the age of the law. After the law came the age of the prophets. But in every age, God has used some form of communication to let the people of God know that I am still God and I am yet reigning, amen, on my throne and in the hearts and lives of men. So now, I might get a little excited today. I can't help it. We're going to try to teach it. All right, amen. But it is so soul stirring that, amen, it just gets you excited about what God has done, what God will do, and what yes. God is doing now. So here it is. I say it where there's no vision of people perish. And in every single age, God has always used a vision to guide his people. Now, in the age of the prophets, a lot of them operated off the vision and the word of God that he had brought to the people. If you go back to Isaiah, he gave Isaiah a vision. Let's look at that for a little bit. Isaiah the first chapter and the first verse. Let's see what it says here. It says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Joppa, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Here he spoke to the prophets or spoke to the nation of Israel through Vision. So vision is important here. All right, now if you turn to Jeremiah, amen, I'm looking at the four major prophets here. Jeremiah, the first chapter, listen to this here. It says, the word of Jeremiah, the son of Hil Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathra, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. Now, if you search down here, amen, and look in the book of Jeremiah, you will see that the word of the Lord came to him in a vision. And I like this in the fifth verse, or the fourth verse, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed thee, in the belly I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee 
amen, a prophet unto the nation. All right, God began to use the prophet Jeremiah. Now, Isaiah was known as a gospel prophet. A lot of Isaiah prophecies related to the coming of Jesus Christ into the world to save his people from sin. Now, Isaiah was the gospel prophet. Then we had Jeremiah, who they called the weeping prophet. Amen. Now, Jeremiah, he spoke primarily to the nation of Israel that because of their disobedience to God, that they were going to go into Babylonian captivity, all right? Then, after they went into captivity, God rose up another young prophet called Ezekiel. So let's turn there to Ezekiel, the first chapter. I'm yet stating that God has always used vision to speak to his people. So if we, I'm going to read down here a little bit. We're not going to dig a lot in the prophetess, but what I'm trying to do is lay a foundation so we can get to the main vision. The vision that relates to the New Testament church in this day and time. Now the first verse says, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives, by the river of Chiba, that the heavens were open and what? And I saw visions of God. Let me tell you something. We need a vision of God today. Anytime God's people has ever been in trouble or faced any kind of situation of extermination or whatever it may be, God has always sent a vision to encourage his people. And Lord, we have a vision today, and we can't even see it. Lord, help us. So here it is, Isaiah. He operated with God through vision. Jeremiah operated through God through vision. Amen. He received the word of the Lord through the visions. Amen. Then Ezekiel, who was a young prophet. Amen. He also received a vision. Then if you go to the next book, which is Daniel, which was one of the four major prophets, he began to receive a vision. Daniel received the vision of the golden image. You don't have to turn now, I'm just going to kind of quote it. Of the great image of and how this image went interpreted was about the empires of the world. All right, then he also received another vision of four beasts. And those four beasts, one represented Babylon. The other beast represented Persia, Medo-Persia, that is. And the third beast represented the Grecian Empire. And the fourth beast represented the Roman Empire. And what's so unique about this, amen, that this Bible is parallel with history. When you study world history, it goes along the same line. It's going to tell you the first major kingdom in the world was Babylon. The second one was the Persian. The third one was the Grecian, amen, and the fourth one was the Roman. A lot of our culture and the things that we have bar uh, borrowed that makes us who we are were taken from those various world empires or the superpowers of their day. So here it is. We got Isaiah, the gospel prophet. We have Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. We have Ezekiel, amen. I would call him the prophet prophet of vision. He had a lot of visions. And here's Daniel, the prophet of interpretation. Because whatever the vision was, Daniel could interpret it. So as he had this vision of a golden image, then he had a vision of, of four beasts which represented four world empires. Then he had a vision of a mountain. And he saw a rock cut out of that mountain. And it came rolling down through Babylon, Persia, amen, the Grecian Empire, and then the rush uh, of the Roman Empire. And as it came down, that rock grew into a mountain, which became, amen, the church of the morning, the New Testament church, which is the church of God, the kingdom of God. And if you study History will bear witness to them. So here it is. We have God who have always operated through vision. So when we come to the New Testament, 
as Christ began to build this church. Amen. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Let's turn in Matthew 16, 13. We're talking about vision. Are y'all with me this morning? Yeah, nah. Amen. We few in numbers, but I like to hear from you. Let me know. Do you understand what we teach you? Nah. We hope you in a cyberspace also understand. And we're just laying a foundation. And I want you all to feel free. You can sign in. You can make comments. You have any questions that you would like. I want you to feel free to put those questions online. Amen. So we can see who we are. Now, Matthew 16, 13 says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and other Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Then he said unto them, but who do ye say that I am? Now, it's one thing for somebody to tell you who Jesus is. But my question to you is, do you know him for yourself? So he had to break it down. He asked them, what are people saying about me? You know what I mean? Yes. What are people asking about me? Then he asked Peter personally, what do you say? Amen. He wanted to know, now you've been following me. Amen. In my message of regeneration. You've been following me as I've been teaching you about the kingdom of God. But I want to know, what do you say? Who am I? Who am I to you? And Simon Peter, I like that, answered and said, Thou art the Christ. Hallelujah. The Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, amen, which is in heaven. Here we see the manifestation of a divine revelation opening. Amen. Peter had received this from God who Christ is. And you know what? You can't follow Christ unless God revealed to you who his son is. There's a lot of people nowadays, even this Sunday morning, they're following man. I tell you. There are many people going to church and do not know Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus said that many to say will say to me in that day, have we not did this, that, and the other? We'll prophesy in your name. Amen. We'll cast out devils in your name. Yeah. We try to invoke divine healing in your name. And Jesus said, well, I never knew that. Because your work was of iniquity. Well, what do you mean? It means just here. There are a lot of people out there called themselves working for God. God never called anybody to work for him. Amen. God is God all by himself. God doesn't need us. Yeah. But God has called us to work with him, not for him. The Bible says that we are workers together, what? With God. Why, when you are working with God, you work as he works. And God don't make no mistake. Can't you give me some more? Thank you. And since God doesn't make any mistakes, as he begins to work and you're following the lead of this Holy Spirit, you won't mess up. So here it is. This divine revelation was manifested unto Peter. Oh, and Peter was able to express it. But Christ let him know that the work of your revelation, it came from God. He said, I say also, well, let me back up. 17 verse. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou. Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say, in other words, I'm going to put my approval on that. Amen. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, upon that solid 
the truth that yeah. you just spoke of. Because I am that rock. Upon that truth that you just spoke of, that is how I'm going to build my church. Yeah. And he let him know that <laughs> thou art Peter, which by interpretation means a little stone. So I'm going to take you as a little stone. But I'm going to go and gather some more stones. And we're going to build a church. Amen. So I thank God for that. But anyway, it is through divine revelation that we come to the understanding. You can study the revelation till you are completely <laughs> blue in the face. But unless God, amen, reveal unto you the symbol, the type, the shadows of this book and the numbering, you will never understand it. That's why many comes up with the wrong interpretation. Now, let's go here to 2 Peter, thank you, Lord, first chapter and the 20th verse. 2 Peter, I think it's the first chapter. If not, it might be the second, but hang in there. We're going to find it. I'm stirred this morning. I'm excited about the class, but I'm excited most of all that I know what the Lord is saying here. I know what the vision is. I'm living what the Lord is saying. I'm living in this vision. Amen. So 2 Peter. Are you with me this morning? Amen. All right. First, okay, 2 Peter, the first chapter and the 20th verse. My pastor, amen, Elder Willie Gordon, used to oftentimes preach this particular scripture. And I'm glad because he drove it home. And for years, this is just how I see it. Knowing this first, there are some things you need to know first. Amen. That no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, you can get a bunch of men. Amen. To, uh, who privately and, and guess at what the scriptures mean. Knowing this first that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. All right. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. This didn't just come up from man. You know, a lot of times people say, oh, the white man wrote the Bible. Oh, the black man wrote the Bible. First of all, ain't no man going to write some Bible that's going to help send him to hell. Because he know if he ain't living the word of God, what the word of God says. But here it is, it says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God, who spake as they were moved, motivated, inspired by the Holy Ghost. See, that is the first criteria. You got to be holy. You can't be carnal. You can't be living in the flesh. You can't be running after the world and you're going to try to understand the things of God. You either with God or you're against God. You are either in Christ or you are in the world. Amen. And you can't have both at the same time. You cannot serve God and mammon. The Bible said, love not the world, neither the things that are in. Why? It was the world that crucified Christ. And it is the world who wants to kill the Christ in you. But listen, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved, they were motivated by the Holy Ghost. We have about 40 different writers. Amen. We have 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New. Some, amen, was kings. Some was prophets. Some was farmers. Some was tax, tax collectors. Some were fishermen. We're talking about people that have come from all walks of life that God used as a divine ink pen to scribble down what he wants to say unto us today. And I thank God for that. So, in order to understand the Bible, amen, we need the Holy Ghost. First of all, you need to live right. And you need the Holy Spirit to guide you 
into truth. All right, because the Bible says, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. You don't make mistakes. He ain't going to lead you wrong. He's not going to misrepresent Christ because they all speak the same thing. All right, now, here, as we go back to the book of Revelation, let's go to one and one. Now I'm going to teach. <laughs> Real excited there. Amen. It makes you want to preach the word of God. But I'm going to tell you something. This is one book I have loved from my youth. And if anybody know me, Brother Rick, you would know many times coming up, there used to be a group of us. We used to get together and we would pray and we would fast all day and night. And we would stay in the church house and we would seek God concerning the book of Revelation. We did it so that people called us the Revelators. You know, but I thank God. I don't know about all of that. But you know what? It was showing that we loved this book. We wanted to understand what God was speaking to the church. And this is what this divine book does. It speaks to the church. It says the revelation of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Now, some commentators, they call it the revelation of St. John the divine. But the apostle John never said that about himself. First of all, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God showed unto his servant, and John was one of his servants. This is not the revelation of John. This didn't come from man. First of all, okay, this is not the revelation of St. John, the divine, as some commentators will put it. The introduction of the first verse tells us that this revelation belongs to God the Father, and he gave it unto his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus gave it to his servant. The revelation is only for the servants of Jesus Christ. That's one reason why we come up with so many false interpretations. Or they say, don't read that book. You're going to go crazy. Don't you read that book. Why? Because in this book you have beasts. Amen. Coming up from the sea. Beasts coming up from the earth. But these are not talking about literal cows and buffaloes or whatever it may be coming up from the earth. But what is talking about these beasts symbolize them. They symbolize power, whether they be politi uh, political or spiritual or religious. Now, this revelation is only for the servants of Jesus Christ. Now, and when it says the servant, it's talking about the true servants. So if you are caught up in denominationalism, sex, amen. This revelation is not for you. It's only for the true church of God. All right. Now listen to you. Say, oh, boy, you're making some strong statements here. Now, if someone wrote you a letter and someone else opened it and read it and even thought the letter was not addressed to them, how would you feel? Even though the letter wasn't addressed to them, how would you feel? You'd be bad, wouldn't you? You'd feel offended. Because that's my letter. What mm -hmm. you doing reading my letter? Well, you probably would feel violated, intruded upon, and offended that someone had opened your mail. Mm -hmm. Everyone who calls himself a Christian in this day and age doesn't mean that they are a servant of God. Therefore, many people out there, they don't even have the right time. They don't have the right interpretation. All right, Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 13, 11, because it is given unto you to know the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Let's go there. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, that's uh, Matthew. Let's turn there. See, the revelation is not for every single one. And if you go to Matthew, the 13th chapter, and you look, at the 11th verse, this is what it says. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. 
there were some people who were going to understand this, and there were some people who are not going to understand it because it's not given to them. It's just like the letter. Now, if I write my wife a love letter, that letter is for her. You ain't going to understand that letter. It ain't going to even make sense to you. Why? It's not your letter. All right. For whosoever have to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever have not from him shall be taken away, even that he has. Therefore speak I unto them in parable. They asked him a question. Why are you speaking to the people in parable? See, he wanted the church to understand, understand some things. But as he was speaking, he knew it would be some who wouldn't understand what he was saying. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see and see not. Sometimes we can be so puffed up by pride and by our own learning, amen, or our theology, amen, our own school knowledge that we think we know everything. Pastor Gordon used to often say, schools make doctors, lawyers, and teachers, but it takes God to make a preacher. Why, the preacher will live like God. Walk like God. Fellowship with God. He will know God and have a relationship with God. But it goes on, therefore I speak unto them in parables, because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not. It says, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, by hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. Why? For this people heart is wax gross. And their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes, they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I will heal them. You wonder why a lot of these people go into church nowadays they hear the word of God but there's no change in their life they yet continue to live in sin they're yet walking in their old ways that is because their conscience is seeing the truth their eyes cannot see the truth you really have to want this and when you really want this God will open your eyes I remember there was a time I was down in Diamond and coming down. I wanted to know truth. I wanted to get, you know, because here it is, it was churches on just about every corner. People were saying that you got to worship God this way. You got to do this. They had me bunk dancing in church and doing this, that, and the other, trying to show me how to speak in tongues and doing all of this. And you know what? I went there empty and when I came home empty. But I'll never forget it. One day I walked in my living room. And as I walked in that living room, something spoke audibly, loud in my mind, saying, sit down. Now, I knew it wasn't nobody but, you know, me, you know, in the living room, who could just be speaking. But I perceived, just like Samuel as a child, that it was the voice of God speaking to me. So I sat down, and you know what? The voice came back to me and said, open the Bible and learn God for yourself. And as I began to uh, study God's word, I began to find out what it meant to live a life free from sin. I began to understand what it means to be born again, to be sanctified, to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And I thank God for that. But anyway, uh, Jesus also said, and signified it by his angels. If we go back to, let's go back to Revelation, first chapter. By, by the way, this is like an introduction to the teaching of a class. So just follow along with us. And if I'm going too fast for you, send me an email, say, well, Rick, slow down, slow down. We want to get this. And if you have any questions, as I said, feel free. It goes on, it says in Revelation. Okay. It says here. 
first verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. What does it mean to have something signified? Now it says Jesus sent and sent and signified it by his angel. That that is by his presence in the vision, so we would know who is the author and the intended audience for this revelation. It was Jesus who laid his hands on John and revealed the vision unto him. And when he said signify, that means it was symbolized. It was put in symbol. All right. This book is about Jesus Christ and his bride. It talks about candlesticks, seal, trumpets, beasts, a dragon, frogs, rivers, Mountain, stars, and moon, and the sun. It talks about the things that we see and understand to be interpreted as symbols relating to condition, to a condition that existed at the time of the writing and what would take place in the future. All right? It's about earthly things being symbolized to represent spiritual things. Jesus said on one occasion, if I tell you earthly things, amen, and you believe not, how are you going to believe if I tell you heavenly things? So you have to be in the spirit to understand these things. You amen. cannot be in the flesh trying to study, amen, this symbolic vision. Jesus told John to write that which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Now notice this. The things which you have seen, that's past tense, the things which are, the things were going on in, in John's day. Yes. Then it goes on, and the things which shall be hereafter. That's future tense. See, so the book of Revelation is for the past. Hallelujah! For the present and for the future. It spans the whole gap of the gospel time. Okay. It goes on. This is speaking of the past, present, and future. The revelation was to cover the ages. This revelation is the record of God. This revelation is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is also the testimony of all the things that John saw in the vision. All right. What does revelation mean? I present that to you all. Can someone tell me again what does revelation mean? The word itself. Okay. I think it derives from revealing. Revelation it reveals it. Anyone else? It says like the scripture or anything. Okay. Well, I wrote down a little definition. Amen. Uh it's it's the discovering to others of what was unknown to them. Disclosure, enlightening, an act of revealing or communicating divine truth. All right. The purpose of the revelation is to show his servants. Who's his servants? Okay, so now he said that this was to give to his servants. So this revelation isn't for anybody. It's only the people that serve in God. Is everybody out here serving God? Absolutely not. It goes on to show his servants the saints, things that would shortly come to pass or transpire in the coming and in the following ages to come. Why? In order that the church might be aware of the enemy's battle tactics. Now, I think of an army. They use the language of Morris Code. Why did they use Morris Code? And when when America's troops would go out to battle. Why was they using Morse code? Excuse me. So the enemy would be able to understand what they were saying to one another. If they had a plan, they didn't want the enemy to know it, but they could communicate with each other in Morse code. Because they all knew the code. I like that. Well, that's, <laughs> a, that's one reason why this book is put into sentence. 
Amen. Because this message is only for a servant. It's just like the letter I was expressing. The letter was only for the one who it was written to. Uh -huh. Well, here it is. The purpose of the revelation is to show to his servants, the saints, things that will shortly come to pass or transpire in the following ages. Why? In order that the church might be aware of the enemy battle tactics so they would know how to prepare to fight and conquer. It reveals clearly what the battle is and where the battle is. Amen. Not only that, the outcome of the battle. Who's going to win? I thank God for that. We need to know the revelation because we have all been affected by those things which John saw in the visions. Did you know that? John saw spirits and forces at work which are present in the world today. These spirits are loose and can affect our soul if we let them. Now I'm reading from my own book. <laughs> yeah. If you're interested, I got a book out called, thank God, it's also on Amazon. You can purchase it or you can go to my website. The website is www.uponthisrockministry.org. I have the whole series for the book of Revelation. Well, I should say three, four, but up on site is for sale at a very, very minimum price, a price that you can afford. You can download these books. If you need it in a Kindle edition, I got it. If you need it in an EPUB edition, I got it. If you need it in a Word document edition, I got it. If you want it in PowerPoint, I got it. And I got even several charts out there. Uh, and the purpose is that we might get a full understanding. And it goes on. These spirits are loose. It can affect our souls if we let them. So we see the church history can teach us something if we will let it. We can profit by other failures and mistakes as well as their victory. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. Let's go there. Now this video is probably going to be broken down in maybe two or three parts. So, because you know, if it's too big, Facebook or YouTube will reject it. So it might be one part, part one, part two, part three. But this introduction is about the vision. The vision of Revelation. This is like an introductory lesson. So we see the church history can teach us something. If we let it, we can profit by others' failures, mistakes, as well as their victories. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, someone got that to 10th chapter, the 11th verse. You know, I need some readers here too, if you can help me. You just got to read it loud. This is my daughter. She's going to read. Come on down here. You can just read it from where you're at. Just read it loud. Now all these things happen unto them for example, example, and they are written for our admonition upon who that the end of the world are coming. Did you see that? It says, now all these things happen unto them for example. Things that we read about, the historic, amen, amen, events in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. Those things happen for our example. I've heard people say, why did God let all those things happen? Amen. Well, those things happen. A lot of it happened because of Israel disobedience. They always got themselves in trouble. And God had to send reformers and prophets to bring them out. But those things were recorded and put on record that they may be an example to us. And they are written for our admonition. In other words, for our instruction. Amen. It says, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand and take heed. Lest he fall. All right. Now, moving on. <laughs> the revelation is signified by his angel unto a servant John. This means that it is written in the language of symbol. A symbol we know is something that stands for or suggests something else by reason of association or relationship. 
All right? The Bible is comprised of 66 books. How many in the Old Testament? Can someone tell me? Come on, we don't talk this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this loud on tape so we won't be embarrassed. But there are 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New. So if you add 39 plus 27, what, what do you come up with? 66. All right. <clears throat> it took a period of about 1,500 years to write this. The Bible was written by 40 different men who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, which I mentioned earlier. These men were farmers and his herdsmen, fishermen. Some was educated like Paul and some were tax collectors. And some were uneducated, but they were all from many different walks of life. I am convinced that you can go to the best seminary, amen, in the world and still not understand the word of God. All right? So here it is. We're moving on. And this very book that I'm teaching from is also available on the line, online. It is The Seven Golden Candlesticks. Also, there's a book out there called Prophetic Symbols. And I tell you, here's another good book, The Message. The Messengers, rather, of the Seventh Seal. If you go to my Facebook page, amen, Ricky Morris, Chesapeake, Virginia, not Chesapeake, Ohio, but Chesapeake, Virginia. And if you go there, you will find a link a group called the Revelation Study Group. All right. Now the Revelation, now, now we come to the book of Revelation. It is the very zenith of the Bible. It is God's last word in prophecy to me. Listen to this. It is the most powerful, panoramic presentation of God's word. It is God's word in a graphical, panoramic vision. It is God's word in powerful symbols. There are some folks who don't regard the book of Revelation as useful, as a useful book today. Some have said that if you read it, as I said, you'll go crazy. Why is it in a graphical, panoramic presentation? Can somebody tell me? Why is it in a graphical, panoramic? presentation. Now, today, it used to be y'all got all kind of devices. You could read things on your telephone. You got tablets. You got laptops. You got desktops. You got the television. You got all kinds of things today. All kinds of devices whereby you can receive information. But there was years, amen, where mostly all men his entertainment was a book. And I can say this for years, for a great portion, amen, in my walk with God, we did not even have a television set. Amen. Now, I'm not saying television is sin. Amen. Because I don't believe sin exists in, uh, in, at, well, you know, in an object. But what I do believe, if that's what consumed you and you give it more time, Amen. To the television set. Or more time to the internet. Or more time on Facebook than you give it to God. You got a problem. Come on. Amen. God's word. I yet love his word. David said, I delight in thy law day and night. Amen. And I thank God. I still love the word of God. When he told the church has effort. He said, thou has left thy first love. Now God is God. And that same God through Christ, amen, became the word of God. Because this, John the Revelator, he went on to say, in the beginning was the word. And the word was God. And the word was with God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And the word became flesh and it dwelt. Dwelt, you mean dwelt, tabernacle among us. Amen. He, and he went on to say, look, I touched it. I handled it. The very word of life. There's nothing like the word of God. 
the number one best seller in the world. Now, yet, you know what? I was a very sickly child coming up, and I didn't have the opportunity as most children to spend a lot of time in school because of asthma, really, really bad. So I was kind of illiterate. I didn't have an understanding. The first book that I have ever read that made sense to me in life was the Bible. And that book I fell in. And they used to laugh at me because when I first got saved, I would go to the store and have my Bible. Amen. I would just, no matter where, out to the park, have my Bible. Went to church, have my Bible. I, I wouldn't be separated. Then later on, when I started learning the hymn books, I had my Bible and my hymn book. And they used to laugh and say, oh, he's trying to save the world. But you know, I just love the word of God. Amen. I wasn't caught up in television. Amen. I was out there telling the bitch. Well, glory to God. My TV wasn't as the world turned. We were trained to get out there, preach the word of God, and turn the world upside down for it. Amen. Amen. I thank God for it. My vision wasn't a soap opera to God in light. Because there was light. Amen. That light of every man that comes into the world. And that light is the light of Christ. I thank God for it. And I thank God for that. And you know what? For the most part, that's just how I operate today. My wife can tell you. When she want to look for me, come upstairs. Amen. I'm in the word of God. Amen. If, if I, or I'm in my man cage in the back. Because it's, I, it's, it's not boring. Hallelujah. It's glory. still exciting. Yeah. Well, glory to God. Yeah. I love thy law. Amen. Day and night. Thank you. Hallelujah. It's not boring. Glory. Praise the living God. The word of God. Amen. Became flesh and dwelt among us. But I like that scripture where Jesus said, the word I speak unto you. They are spirit and they are life. It yet inspires me. Hallelujah to God. And that's why I saw fit to do this today. All right, our thought. The servants of God. First of all, let me say, the book of Revelation is not for everyone. The unrepentant, the unregenerate, those who are yet living in sin, and those who are just religious, without a real experience of the new birth, cannot understand the book of Revelation. In Revelation verse 1, the Bible says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servant. Just because you go to church, just because you sing in a choir, and may have been baptized, doesn't make you a servant of God. You must be born again. And in the kingdom of God. Now, our next stop. God's time clock. Did y'all not know God had a time clock? Well, we use a time clock to know where, where we at in a day. To schedule our events. Yes. Amen. To set our agenda for the day. To carry out our to-do list. Amen. We all function by time. Well, I'm going to tell you something. God has a time clock. Amen. Listen, we will take a look at God's time clock. The term must surely come to pass denotes a time period. Believe it or not, God actually has a time clock. And it's in the Bible to help us in our study. We will like to learn a little bit about God's time clock. Down through the ages, God has always had a period when he dealt with man on some level. There was the antediluvian age. There was the age of the patriarchs, the age of the law uh, under Moses. There was the age of the prophets, all the way up until John the Baptist. God in every age has always revealed to his people the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, some will tell you that God's time clock of prophecy will stop in Calvary. And that it will not start ticking again until Jesus returns. That's kind of like that dispensationalist listen to you. But I want you to know the clock is yet ticking. 
Because the Bible says now is the day of salvation. And every man should repent. The following passage denote a time and a day. And we shall talk about that day. If God's time clock has stopped, no one can get saved. God's time clock has not stopped concerning salvation and has not stopped in regards to prophecy being fulfilled either. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it here. I thank God for what he has done. I thank God for his inspiration this day. And we're going to pick up part two of this introduction because it lays the foundation of the teaching of Revelation. you got to understand, and I encourage you, number one, the first thing you should study is the messenger of the seven seals. There are people, amen, that spent a lot of their life and devoted themselves to get this message out. The message of the, the messengers of the seven seals. The second book, which is a prerequisite to this right here, the seven golden candlestick, is prophetic symbol. It deals quite a bit with time, it deals with symbols, and it deals with types to help us get an understanding of the nature and what the book of Revelation is made up of. So, uh, and so on part two of this introduction, we will be studying the dates. I want to address that. You know, because we put different dates on our revelation charts, like AD 33 or AD 250 and 70, AD 530 or 540, give and take 10 years or more, AD 1530, 1818. Why do we put them dates on? Amen. What is the purpose of it? And uh, I want you to stick with me uh, because I believe it's going to be a great blessing to you. But I thank you for your participation. And for you who have tuned in, this is just an introduction of what we're doing here. I would say I'm sorry for my excitement, but I never want to lose it because I'm very excited and I want to stay excited. And I want to get you excited about the things of God. So, uh, Pray for us at this time. Lord, we thank you. Amen. For your understanding. We thank you for what you have done and what you're yet able to do. Continue to bless us, O oh God, in the study of thy word, O oh God. Amen. You said study to show thyself approved, a work that need not be ashamed. Rightly divided the word of truth. Thank God, Lord, that you have given us vision, a great vision. Amen. That's able to maneuver us to the other side. So Lord, we ask that you continue to encourage our hearts, lift our spirit, even as we go throughout this day. We give this day into your hand. Keep us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.